The Soviet Union was founded by the victors of the Russian Civil War, which lasted from 1917 until 1922, and which led to somewhere in the neighborhood of a few hundred thousand to as many as several million deaths, many of those being civilian deaths as part of twin terror campaigns, often referred to as the White Terror and the Red Terror, for atrocities committed by the dominant Russian army, the White Guard, and the communist Bolshevik army, respectively. However many deaths there were, and whomever perpetrated those killings, the Russian economy was demolished by this civil war, and this infrastructural devastation was amplified by a severe drought, followed by a famine, which happened alongside a typhus pandemic that itself killed millions of people in 1920 alone. Poverty at this time was immense, starvation and homelessness were common, and a bunch of neighboring states that were pulled into the Union after having declared independence from Russia in recent years were suffering under the same conditions. The central government had not yet spun up sufficiently to do much about these issues in the aftermath of this significant internal conflict. That essentially describes the birth of the Soviet Union, which was formed to align with ideologies held by the Russian Communist Party, and was initially made up of the Russian Soviet Federative Republic, the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic, and the Transcaucasian Socialist Federative Soviet Republic. These four nations were unified as states of a larger nation, and the New Economic Policy, or NEP, which was proposed by a political theorist and politician named Vladimir Lenin in 1921, formed the backbone of the economic system that they shared. And basically, the NEP said that this union would have a free market and capitalism, but both of those economic elements would be moderated and controlled at times by the central government. And alongside private economic entities, there would also be state-controlled business entities that would operate using the incentives of the market. They would operate to make a profit, in other words, but would be owned by the government rather than private investors or business owners. This managed market model allowed the embryonic Soviet Union to pull itself out of economic ruin, and it fed into other policies in subsequent years, like monetary reform and the allowance of some commercial enterprises that were partially or completely foreign-owned, which brought in customers and investors from elsewhere and further amped up their economy, helping them muscle their way out of that Civil War era collapse. The NEP continued to benefit the economy in this way until 1928, when, four years after Lenin's death, the General Secretary of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, began what is today typically called the Great Turn, which refers to a stifling of, and then outright removal of, the NEP economic model and the rapid implementation of a new form of economics and social and governmental structure that was focused on a massive acceleration toward the promise of collectivization and industrialization, two concepts that were core to the communist model the Soviet Union was using as the foundation of its governmental philosophy. The purpose of this dramatic pivot was to catch up to all the capitalistic societies that the Soviet Union was now competing with around the world. They wanted to stick with their philosophical underpinnings, though, rather than becoming more capitalist, like those competitors. So Stalin threw the Union into disarray with the intention of skipping a bunch of technological and economic steps that those outside capitalistic nations had worked their way through to get to where they were, in terms of their wealth and production capabilities. Stalin wanted to leapfrog the competition, in other words. The outcome of this move was a very mixed bag, and that's maybe a bit of an understatement. 
the first of what would become many five-year plans oriented around this and future goals involved the rapid deployment of heavy industry infrastructure, the collectivization of agriculture, which basically meant organizing all of the union's agricultural activities, resources, and laborers into state-controlled farms, which could then be managed on a top-down basis, and a massive investment in the country's military capabilities. This sudden jolt in a new direction, and the implementation of plans that were only really half-baked, led to another huge famine, which caused millions of deaths around the Union, and especially in Ukraine and Kazakhstan. But it also led to rapid urbanization and industrialization, as peasants fled the countryside, hoping to avoid starving to death, or being legally attached to these badly organized, state-controlled farms, and they thus ended up in cities where they worked in factories instead. The People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, or NKVD, became infamous in those early decades of Stalin's rule, as they operated a secret police unit that purged those who Stalin and his immediate reports considered to be insufficiently dedicated to the cause, to Stalin, and to the Soviet Union, as Stalin envisioned it. Most of the original leaders who formed the Union in the first place were eventually purged by this group, as were millions of other citizens across the Union. Some were sent to gulags, which were forced labor camps set up around the country, where prisoners were often worked to death, while others were privately or publicly executed for their alleged crimes. This system of dealing with the seemingly insufficiently loyal and of purging, either imprisoning for life or killing, often using secret police forces to do so, continued through World War II and into the Cold War era, at which point many of these factors were increased by the dramatic influx of wealth, productivity, and international prestige the country, and Stalin in particular, earned as a consequence of being on the winning side of that conflict. By the 1950s, Stalin had built the Union into what amounted to a personality cult, a collection of states that was technically communist in ideology, but which in many practical terms was oriented almost completely around the core power structure of their generalissimus, a term that Stalin adopted for himself in 1945 in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. Stalin's words were carried across the Union and around the world daily by the state's Pravda newspaper and the other mouthpieces of the Union's government. His face was plastered across buildings, on trains, and in classrooms. And as he reinforced his position and his power, he also became increasingly paranoid killing off close friends, bugging the offices and homes of those who remained, erasing those who he thought had wronged him from photos before having them killed, and imprisoning anyone who even knew those people. The gulag system was increased in scale, and then increased again. By January of 1953, about 3% of the entire Soviet population was imprisoned, or in so-called internal exile in an isolated camp or a penal colony. Around this time, as the whole of the Union's leadership was being purged, imprisoned, or demoted from public office, due in large part to Stalin's paranoia, the Union was also experiencing a severe and persistent food shortage, catalyzed by a drought that then fed an ongoing famine. That food shortage was amplified further by Stalin's decision to stockpile food rather than distributing it to the hardest-hit regions, and somewhere between a million and a million and a half Soviet citizens are thought to have died as a direct result of that choice. As part of his larger effort to reinforce his own power and to hamstring anyone who might try to take that power from him, Stalin also separated much of the Union from the rest of the world, a media shutdown that Winston Churchill called the Iron Curtain, a governmental and increasingly practical separation of Eastern Europe from Western Europe. After several years of bad health, during which Stalin imprisoned or killed many of his own doctors, who he suspected of treachery of various sorts, Stalin died shortly after suffering a cerebral hemorrhage. The political philosophy 
conception of communism and approach to governance, which might also be described as top-down governance using the power of a personality cult and absolute control and intimidation, which had become known as Stalinism, continued in some form until the early 1960s, at which point the Soviet Union tried out a variety of tweaks and changes to that system, though many of the most oppressive of these policies and approaches remained in place until the whole system began to crumble in the 1980s and then eventually fell apart in the early 1990s, leading to the collapse of the Soviet Union, the re-emergence of a country called Russia, and eventually the version of governance that we see in this part of the world today. What I'd like to talk about today is Russia under Vladimir Putin and the meaning and potential of an oppositional character who has been gaining support amongst the Russian population. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. One of the simplest ways to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. Folks who contribute any amount each month receive an additional episode of the show each month and a call-to-action and ad-free version of the show. A great big thanks to everybody who's already supporting the show in some way, and thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to start with today comes from The New Yorker, and it's entitled Navalny's Long-Running Battle with Putin Enters a New Phase. Vladimir Putin is, as of the day I'm recording this in early 2021, the president of Russia, and he's held both the presidency and the prime ministership of the country since 1999, when the previous president, Boris Yeltsin, left office, leaving Putin as the acting president. He was then elected to that role on a longer-term basis, about four months later. Part of Putin's staying power in this role is undoubtedly attributable to his economic success during the early years of his political ascension. Under his leadership, wages ballooned, the country's GDP increased by over 70%, and both poverty and unemployment were cut in half. This economic success story wasn't really a Putin-catalyzed miracle, It was largely the consequence of a global commodities boom that led to a dramatic increase in oil prices during that period. And oil and gas make up most of Russia's exports. So they, and most other countries that had well-developed fossil fuel-based economies, did pretty well during this handful of years in the early 2000s. Now that said, Putin's government also made some smart choices as they phased out the remaining communist-era systems that were standing in the way of foreign investment. They also implemented new fiscal policies that helped pull the country out of a depression that had been haunting their economy since the late 1980s. So there was a lot of luck involved, but also some skilled politicking and governance. Before his political ascendance, Putin was a law student who, after graduating, worked as a foreign intelligence officer for the KGB, the country's secret police force, and he did that for 16 years. He resigned from the service in 1991 to enter politics, ended up in Yeltsin's administration in 1996, and he remained in the administration until Yeltsin's aforementioned withdrawal from office. Alexei Navalny is also Russian and is only 44 years old to Putin's 68. Navalny is the leader of the Russia of the Future Party, an opposition party that was originally known as the People's Alliance and also the Progress Party, but which under all names has positioned itself against Putin's United Russia Party. And it's done that since 2012, under its original founder, and then beginning in mid-2018, it was under the leadership of Navalny. Russia of the future 
among other things, is focused on anti-corruption, the decentralization of power in Russia, and a revitalization of the rule of law within the country. The main criticism leveled by this party against the currently ruling cadre is that a very small number of wealthy and politically influential people, often referred to as oligarchs, run essentially everything. Democratic systems within Russia are a farce, a Potemkin village meant to make citizens and the world believe that Russia is a functioning democracy, rather than an oligarchy run by Putin and his fellow ultra-wealthy Russians. And they believe that with reforms of various kinds, the country could do much better because the majority of the nation's resources would not be going into the pockets of these powerful few at the expense of the comparably impoverished many. Russia of the future is not formally recognized by the country's Ministry of Justice, which is a requirement if they're ever going to be official in the eyes of the government. And Navalny, in his role as the leader of this party, but also in his other roles, is not particularly well regarded by the government either. Among his other roles, Navalny is a politician. He's run for office a few times, and he took second place in the Moscow mayoral election in 2013, which is significant in a country that is known to stack the deck when it comes to such elections. He also tried to run for president in 2016, but he was prevented from doing so by the government because, according to them, he had a criminal conviction on his record. That conviction, having been earned in 2013, when Navalny was charged with embezzlement, though an outside analysis of this conviction indicates that it was likely a politically motivated smear campaign, not a legitimate criminal trial and the same determination has been made by external observers regarding a second case for a similar alleged crime in 2014. Navalny, like Putin, also went to school to earn a law degree, but rather than going to work for the secret police, he went into the financial world, which eventually led to a personal investment in five local oil and gas companies, all of which he then tried to investigate because their finances were not transparent even to investors, and they were legally required to divulge their assets. In late 2010, Navalny published secret documents from a Russian oil pipeline company's auditors, which revealed that about $4 billion were stolen by the company's leaders during the construction of a major pipeline. He started up an anti-corruption project in the aftermath of that divulgence, and this led to a flourishing online publishing career, predicated on acquiring often confidential information, publishing evidence about corruption and corrupt individuals, and attempting to show where the country's vast fossil fuel wealth was actually going. And a bit of a spoiler here, it usually goes to the politicians and other oligarchs, not to the people, the schools, the roads and so on. In some cases, governmental action was taken in the wake of these corruption-focused revelations, but more often, they were glossed over or countered with an arrest or some other type of attack against Navalny. Typically, though, even when he was running for higher office or publishing embarrassing documents related to Putin or his close confidants, the government didn't officially take note of Navalny or his work they would refer to the issues in a roundabout way, or vaguely gesture at what they would call a small group of angry and confused people, rather than identifying him or his unofficial political party by name, or justifying their accusations by addressing them directly. This changed in 2020. In August of 2020, Navalny was on a flight to Moscow when he became violently sick, resulting in an emergency landing, him going into a coma, and an extraction from where the plane landed in Russia to a hospital in Berlin, where doctors confirmed the suspicion that he had been poisoned by a nerve agent from a family of such substances called Novichok, a type of chemical weapon that was originally developed in the Soviet Union, and which has proven to be a favorite of Russian forces over the years, including its use in a highly publicized attack on a Russian double agent in Amesbury in the United Kingdom back in 2018. 
Navalny was up from his coma in early September of 2020, and later that month it was announced that he would return to Russia, despite having been poisoned under circumstances that heavily implied the Russian government had probably tried to kill him. In December of 2020, a joint investigation by Bellingcat, The Insider, CNN, and Der Spiegel implicated the FSB, which is the successor to the country's KGB secret police organization, in the nerve agent attack on Navalny. Later that month, in a recording that seems to feature Navalny pretending to be a Russian security official, speaking to a chemical weapons expert, that expert told Navalny that the Russian government-affiliated team was able to poison him by applying the nerve agent to the inside of his underwear. This recording went viral, and it added to Navalny's international popularity and dramatically increased international awareness of his group and what they stand for. In mid-January of 2021, Navalny took a flight from Germany to Moscow, announcing his travel plans to his online followers and telling them to meet him at the airport. But the flight was redirected to another airport before it could land, and Navalny was taken into custody by the Russian government at passport control. Russian officials said that he would remain in custody until after his hearing which could lead to jail time because he violated his probation by leaving Russia. Though, of course, he left Russia while in a coma during that emergency medical extraction to Berlin, back when he was poisoned. The next day, Navalny was ordered to be detained until mid-February because of that parole violation, and it was declared that he would have another hearing at the end of January to determine whether he should be put in jail instead of merely detained temporarily. In a short video, recorded and published before he was detained and prevented from accessing the internet, Navalny called on his supporters to take to the streets to protest corruption and lawlessness in Russia. And the next day, a nearly two-hour documentary hosted by Navalny was released on YouTube. The documentary is an investigation into a sprawling, castle-like mansion complex worth well over a billion dollars that is reportedly owned by Putin, and which was, according to the evidence provided by Navalny, purchased for Putin by a network of oligarchs. The film is entitled A Palace for Putin, the story of the biggest bribe, and has, as of the day I'm recording this, been viewed on YouTube about 100 million times. The new phase, referenced in the title of that New Yorker piece then, is this escalatory moment in which opponents who never came into direct contact with each other, one of whom never even spoke the other's name in public, are more directly attacking each other. Putin, through the tools of state, including state-sanctioned assassination, by all indications, and Navalny, through the tools of populism and protest, utilizing primarily online tools to make himself an influencer of sorts, attracting an ever-growing fan base for his message about Russia and the corruption of the current Russian power structure, putting himself even more in harm's way as a consequence but seeming to gain more influence every time he defies that power structure publicly. This is a story that will continue to evolve, and I'm recording this a few days before that next trial, so there's a good chance that we'll either see Navalny locked away for the foreseeable future, or we will see some kind of slap-on-the-wrist punishment intended to avoid making Navalny into a martyr for the cause. There are several confounding factors to either decision, though. Most prominent among them, at the moment, the success of the first round of protests that followed Navalny's initial lockup upon his return to Russia. These protests began on January 23rd and led to some truly remarkable images and videos. Tens of thousands of people hit the streets in the middle of the cold Russian winter, in some cases facing temperatures as low as negative 50 degrees Celsius, to carry signs, shout anti-corruption and release Navalny-themed slogans, and to face off against the police, who were pelted by endless snowballs, pushed and shoved by the crowds, and who then beat up and attacked protesters in return. The footage from some of these protests is really something to watch. 
Now, this doesn't mean the protests will lead to positive outcomes for Navalny. This is not the first time Putin's administration has faced these kinds of protests. And so far, at least, protests that broke out after purported electoral fraud in late 2011 were larger in scale than this new batch, though this new wave of protests has only just started, with another round planned for the weekend after Navalny's next hearing. So a lot could happen in the very near future, and may have already happened by the time you hear this. It's also notable that Navalny's videos regularly attract tens of millions of views, often overshadowing Russia's official TV station in terms of audience. So even with worries of making a martyr out of him, Putin could do the math and decide that Navalny is better off either dead or imprisoned long enough for everyone to forget who he is. Still a gamble, if history is any guide, but an approach that has worked more than once for Russian leaders, including Putin himself. International reception, from the democratic world at least, has been largely favorable toward Navalny, though there are concerns in some circles that if he's able to make Putin look too bad, in the eyes of the average Russian, Putin may lash out and do something dramatic and brazen in order to reclaim public support and polish up his image as was the case in early 2014, when unmarked Russian soldiers began their attack on the Ukrainian Crimean Peninsula, an asymmetric military move that would eventually lead to the quote-unquote annexation of that strategically important region by Russia. This is a move that came shortly after a long series of protests and a period of low public support for Putin's administration and it's thought that he might take action of a similar scale and type to both pull attention away from Navalny's corruption claims and to up his own public image by portraying a strong, forceful Russia on the international stage, if things go too far in the direction that they're currently headed, at least. That said, it's also possible that the evolution of technology and communication mediums will make such a move less effective, and skilled online communicators like Navalny, or whomever steps up to replace him in the public eye, if he is indeed locked away or killed, will have a significant advantage in this contemporary iteration of Russian ideological conflict. <laughs> enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. Folks who contribute any amount each month at patreon.com slash let's know things receive an additional episode of the show each month and a call to action and ad-free version of the show. That said, you can find a more complete list of both monetary and non-monetary ways of helping to support this show at letsknowthings.com slash support. The book that I'd like to recommend today is a novel called Born, B-O-R-N-E, by Jeff Vandermeer. Born is a fairly bizarre science fiction story set in an undefined near-future city that is locked into a state of what would seem to be kind of a recently post-collapse hellscape in an urban center that orients around a collection of developments within the bioengineering space. And it orients in particular around a scavenger, her relationships and one relationship in particular with a piece of bioengineering, a creature that she discovers while out scavenging. And a lot of the story is about the development of that relationship with this bioengineered creature, but the world in which they exist, the shape of it, the entities that are in conflict within that space, including a giant levitating bear, were to me the most interesting components of this story. So if you're looking for a fun read that is somewhat fantastical in the type of world that it portrays, but also interesting because of the characters and the bizarre circumstances in which those characters find themselves, consider picking up a copy of Born by Jeff Vandermeer. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. 
You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my other podcast, Brain Lenses, at brainlenses.com or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find my daily news-centric newsletter at yesterdaysnewsletter.com, and you can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com. Feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook, and at Colin is my name on most of the other ones. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Thank you.